Welcome to the second studio design and architecture show hosted by two architects, myself, David Lee, and Marina Bor Daronay. Bor Daronay. It's two. Your middle name is Bor. The people don't know this. Your no, last name not. is Daronay. This week is just the two of us in a highly, uh, one of the highly coveted fellow designer episodes <laughs> that we haven't done in a while. But look, we don't want to abandon our fellow designers. Ah, wink, wink. So we're doing one of these. Uh, I think we did one not too long ago, but this is the first one we've done as a video recording. So this might make it on YouTube, depending you, on you're putting how a lot of pressure on this episode already. Why? <laughs> um, longest intro ever. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about today. Well, 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 we are talking about the differences between architecture school and architecture practice. Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons why is that this topic has come up a number of times on this podcast because we speak to a lot of architects who are also teachers. That's an important part of being an architect, I think. Um, and uh, it's a theme. It's a theme. It's it's uh, why why are there differences? What are the differences? And uh, what should we do to address them or not address them? So in this recording, we're just going to talk about what the differences are, right? And then good luck, you guys figure it and out. You got to figure it out. And maybe, maybe in the future we'll do a recording about <clears throat> how we think the, the gap between academia and practice can be addressed. But for today, is just what are the differences? Um, maybe this would be useful for everybody. What do you think? You don't seem convinced. Okay, good. Yeah, maybe. Moving. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I'm surprised you you wanted to talk about this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <I did>. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you came up <laughs> with it, man. <laughs> Probably the biggest difference and the most obvious difference between uh, doing architecture in a school setting versus architecture in the real world, let's call it, is that when you produce architecture in the real world, it gets built. So you're not just designing fake projects, but they get constructed into buildings. In the, in the best so, and worst way, yes. Yeah, so, so, but what, what does that really mean, though? Like, let's unpack that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please explain to me the origin of the universe. No, well, no. well, all right. Well, I mean, in school, you're really just, they're just idea projects, right? Like, how far is the school project going to live? Right. Mm -hmm. It's gonna go it's gonna live maybe up to a 3D model, 3D renderings and maybe even a physical model. Mm -hmm. Right. But you're never really gonna know like how much what you design is gonna cost. How long would that even take to build? Right. Yeah. Like it's it's very it, it it's it's a concept, it's an idea project, right? It's if you transfer that, translate that to like the the practice itself, you're probably into Concept end design. of concept design like you're probably not even into schematics or very early into schematics right yeah uh it may be like you know the most advanced year of your degree yeah and, and so for people who don't know there's concept design schematic design design development construction documentation construction administration and then usually that's about it but like concept design the first phase is usually the shortest out of, out of all of them yeah and so, it's really about getting the juice <clears throat> getting the juice of the project, right? Like yeah. Getting the essence of the project and nailing that down, which, you know, it's very much what school is about in most cases. And that's a really huge difference because that means that the, like how far you take a project, not just in terms of construction, but in terms of its, um, it, its, its development in the abstract space of drawing is only the first few baby steps in school, right? Um, and that also means that I think... Obviously, when you produce a building in, in like in reality, it takes a long time to do. And again, it's, uh, to, to construct, it takes a long time, it could take years, um, most often years. Uh, but also the documentation of it, the drawing of it takes a really long time as well. Sometimes so years. The difference from, I think, the perspective of the designer <clears throat> or future architect is that projects in, in, in practice take much longer than they do in school. And so I think that a lot of times means that the creative faction, creative, creative satisfaction you get out of a project in school, it doesn't happen in practice. So that's where we will hear uh, sometimes architecture students, um, they graduate and they start practicing and working at an office and they realize this isn't for them because it takes way too long. They don't have the patience for it, right? In school, you're working at a pace of like every six months if you're in a semester, or not even six months, probably like four months or three months, depending on quarter or semester system. And so every three months, you're getting satisfaction. And a lot of school projects are even shorter than that. You know, in the under, what do you call it, lower division classes, you might have multiple projects a quarter or a semester. So it's like every month, every two months, every three months, 
I'm the, the entire project from the student's perspective is complete from beginning to end, right? And there's a kind of um, you know euphoric uh, emotion that happens at the end of the project because it's done with. You went through the whole thing. It's that is the project, right? In reality, that's not the project. The project is the building that gets constructed, and it's not done until it's in not just open, but it's being used, right? And it's it's beginning its life on that end. And um, so I think one of the the big differences is that is that once you start practicing, you start to lose some of that again that creative satisfaction because you. you you can't really be super stoked about creating about getting through SD. You can be a little bit excited about completing a phase like schematic design or design development or CDs. That's a big one for us. Like, yeah, we're done with CDs, but that's not really the time to celebrate, right? The time to celebrate is when it's all done, it's being used, and there aren't any problems, and there's photographs. That's the time. Yeah, and by that time, everybody's exhausted, and no one cares anymore. <laughs> Everyone wants to move on into the next thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think from the first person perspective, stamina is a really is a really big one and patience is a really big one but i mean the the you know the kind of like the wave of emotion of uh, you know a project in school or in practice is about the same right like you start from zero and you work toward the goal of either final review or mm -hmm. the completion of a building and it's just they're the same uh, there's probably like more ups and downs in the practice but there is kind of the same targeted goal of emotion you know, ending, giving your best, doing it all, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's it's much more compressed in school uh, than it is in the real life. Yeah, and the other interesting thing if we're talking about the project and the work itself is that I think everyone knows that in school the idea of a concept is uh, very prevalent and very important, right? Uh, for most, most uh, universities. You do an architecture project, what's your concept? Right. And your project is a realization of that concept or an expression of that concept. And I think it is because it's a way to also evaluate the creative quality of the work that's being produced. And then also a way to evaluate um, or, or make diff like differ that differentiates the level of students. Right. Yeah. If everybody has the same row set, the same side, the same exercise, how do you therefore, and you don't want to decide which one is best based on like, which one is the prettiest, right? Yeah. You have to have something that's a little bit more, um, has like stronger grounds to judge on. Yes, and that reminds me of something of, about context, but but uh, what I was gonna say with the concept is that what I, what I see is that in school, that's like the first thing everyone talks, uh, every, that's the first thing everyone talks about. But in practice, most of the offices I've been around, most of the projects do not have a concept behind them not in the way that you do in school that might be shocking i think for for young designers because it's like concept that's like the only thing we talk about in school what is your concept what is your concept what is your concept in practice uh again this is based on our experience practitioners they they, they will think conceptually right there's conceptual thinking but there's not a concept capital c concept for the project a lot of times it's more about like making sure there's some consistency in the uh, aesthetics of the project and the gestures and the spirit, right? But not necessarily all of that is being, you know, uh, guided by this large concept. Yeah, and oftentimes in an office, the concept maybe is not there from the beginning. It's not the driving force of the design. Yeah. Some, sometimes and most times, there might be a concept that comes at the end, like you kind of figure out what the building was about. Mm -hmm. But it's not really what you, this is something you decide on at the beginning, you're like, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, it's just design around that. Because there is so many parameters you have to design around already, yeah. that it's almost hard to find what the essence of the project is. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think, I think that gets back to your previous point about, um, like, context, right? And in practice, there's so many things you have to respond to, that that is what drives a lot of the pro design process, right? And whether or not that's good or bad, we can talk about, but that drives the design process. So a lot of times, real buildings, the design process of them is more about responding to these specific things and meeting these different criteria and making something that looks good and you know, has some kind of consistent uh, through line or spirit to it, um, rather than starting from a blank page and saying, you know, what is my big question mark concept? Because there's so many real things you have to respond to. And that's a difference also between um, practice in school. In school, you you have a site and stuff, 
but the constraints are not as real. They're not as uh, hard edged, right? They're well, squishy. Yeah, I mean, you what well, that, and you can also have some blinders on some of them. Yeah. Like you're kind of ignoring on purpose some of them because mm-hmm. it's not the point of the exercise. Um, but like, if you think about concept, it's cool when you when you have one of those design project you have to do right like how much time if let's say you have two months to come up with a project how much of that two months is dedicated to finding the concept and how much is dedicated to the execution of the drawings and the final presentation board and the model right like mm-hmm. probably a good chunk is allocated to thinking about the concept in practice time again you know time is money right and again you have all the rules you have to respond to you have the code you have you know building permits you have zoning you have exp- client yeah. expectation budget schedule all those things you cannot afford to spend like a month figuring out what the concept is going to be yeah and i think that's interesting so then it begs the question like well why do we focus on that in school if in practice that's not what happens because the the settings of reality don't really allow for it and we can speculate, of course, but I think that it's because the in practice there should be conceptual thinking, and furthermore, there should be a concept behind your building. It's just that is really difficult to do because of all the constraints you just mentioned. And so, I don't want people thinking that because of this last part of the conversation that we are advocating that that learning how to develop a concept and develop a project from that concept is not valuable. Right. Or that, oh, it's just a learning exercise, but you're never going to actually use this. That's not the case. Right. I, I'm saying that a lot of their offices I've seen, they don't have concepts behind their projects. I am not saying that's good. Right. In yeah, fact, yeah, I would yeah. say that's that's not good. Um, that doesn't mean you, 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 you can't produce a really nice, productive, successful, helpful, you know, to the population building without a concept. Of course you can. But are we going to get to that next level of capital A architecture without a concept? No, not possible. Right. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Like, uh, you know. I oh, think... really? Is that what you're going to say? Or are you going to say that yeah, that's what you're going to say? No, that was what I was going to say. <laughs> the whole point of the exercise of coming up with concept, <laughs> it's not just for funsies and making Funsy, shit yeah. up, right? Yeah. It's it's to actually create without having anything mm-hmm. and finding what's the first thing should be and being critical about why is this thing and not this thing and what does it mean, right? It's more of a philosophical um, question in the design process than it is uh, necessarily a formal mm-hmm. question, you know? And oftentimes I feel like the boundaries between what the concept is, you know, it's oftentimes a formal thing or at least the way maybe offices would use the concept. Oh, I wanted to design like a space needle. So that's why the building is pointy. Well, that's a formal concept. That's uh, you true. Know, they're, uh, you know, yeah. it's kind of bullshit in a way, right? Yeah. No, but that, if the concept true. is something that's much less tangible, much yeah. more abstract and philosophical and, and theoretical, then, you know, it's... It's, it's an idea. It's not a form. It's an idea that's in the project. Yes. And that gets to the question of what is an architecture concept? Here's a plug. Go back to episode <laughs> whatever <laughs> we did a year ago about developing an architecture concept. But that's really important, what you just said, uh, because I think the word concept is thrown around way too loosely and it's used inaccurately and inappropriately, incorrectly. Um, like the space needle. It's so silly. No, but you know, a concept's and, and... a cube. No, a cube's not a concept unless you... I suppose it could be, but but it's not a concept if your building ends up looking like a cube. No, it's just a shape. No, and so the con- again, <laughs> you know, not to go back to the concept conversation, but the concept should have some kind of critical position on thing. It's not just like I want it to be the shape of something else because what it's cool, you know. It's almost and, like and a- oftentimes, you know, offices in practice have a tendency to use concept as more of a marketing thing than they yeah. actually really thought about that during the process. So. Yeah. No, just... There was something else that you said about um, the fact that concepts are used so, what am I trying to say? When concepts are relied on as a part of education and as a part of critiquing a school project, it's because it's it's giving something to critique against. Do you remember you said something like that? Yeah, yeah. you cannot, <clears throat> you know, you have a, a group of 10 students Maybe they could all design something beautiful, right? But, you know, well, they might, might just be very talented. Doesn't mean that there is a critical mind behind it. And that's kind of what architects are, right? They have mm-hmm. an ability of thinking and rethinking and question things. And that's really what should be developed in school, right? So how do you 
judge project against each other or or you know um or 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 teach architecture to people who are already talented in a way right you kind of have to like well yeah yeah no i i think it's interesting this question of how do you test architecture or critique an architecture and to critique something means you have to have an understanding of of um the criteria right yeah right uh, like again you scoring this aspect one out of ten kind of situation and um, I had mentioned that the context or like the site constraints and all the other constraints that you deal with in a school project are less. And you said we, we actually intentionally ignore some of them, mm -hmm. like budget, for example. And we should because it would overwhelm any student for sure. Um, and I think like, how do I put this? So like if there's a total amount of things, uh, a criteria to, to critique a project, okay, a total amount of criteria, in practice, that is mostly made up of all the stuff you mentioned. Building code, zoning code, budget, materials, um, uh, availability, climate, all, all of that, like real life stuff. In school, what happens is that we remove, I would say like 90% of that, right? And and so, so what fills up the remaining 90% that you've removed? It's the concept, mm -hmm. right? And I would not change that as a way of teaching. I think that's important because you need to learn how to develop those, those thinking skills. And so that that's a weird that's a weird thing. So what happens is that, that if in a project, a school project, if the majority of the critique is based on what the concept is, the validity of the concept, and then whether or not you executed it correctly, right? That is a different way of thinking about architecture, a different design process, a different critique, a different ball game from critiquing an architecture based on all the real life criteria. And so, so, so what, what that means is that I think that the thinking that happens in school because of that, I feel is in many ways much more advanced, much more abstract, and it's higher level than the thinking of the problem solving thinking that has to happen in practice. Most cases. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I mean, it's more philosophical. And exactly. It's, it's more like you have bigger questions you're trying to <laughs> respond and yeah. just, uh, you know, like, how am I going to detail this flashing? Yeah. Right? Um, but the other thing that's also, I think, a big difference between architecture school and architecture practice is the way... It's the bubble in which architecture is being looked at. Okay. Um, in school, it's very insular, right? It's between architects, between students and architects. It's it's a very close bubble. And mm -hmm. when you step out of that, like it's the world. Like everyone around you is judging architecture, is talking about like it's it's exposed. Like the bubble has popped, yeah. right? Um and I think that's kind of like the things that you're probably not even thinking when you're in school. You know, there is something very personal about the work that you do in architecture school. Even if, you know, you're not designing your own house. Mm -hmm. You know, every single project, you take it somehow personally. It's your personal interests. It's the things you are interested in, right? Yeah. It's question like you're asking yourself to find the answers. It's a very introspective process. But, and, and therefore, there is a danger for students to maybe think that that's what it's going to be later on, and it's about you. But it's mm -hmm. not about you, actually. It's it's not even about your introspection after you get out of school. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of like sh like giant shift, mm -hmm. right, between uh, being a student and being a, a professional architect is that architecture is not in a vacuum anymore. Like you have to, I mean, this opens up a whole bunch of yeah. other questions, but you know. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So um, I think that's a really good point. I mean, in, in school, it is all about the student because you're paying, you or your family, you are paying to go to this place to learn. Yeah. So it's a very self-centered time in your life. I mean, it's, ext it's extremely self-centered. It's even more self-centered now because universities in the United States, like they pamper you. It's like, oh, you want seared ah, you like ridiculous. You know, tacos with your like school debit card, which you don't pay for, you know, like, so. Well, you will pay for it. You just don't know yet you're paying for it. <laughs> yeah, I would have eaten a few. Le I didn't have seared ah, tacos. We had chicken quesadillas, which are horrible. It's all like trash. Oh, my God. So we would down it with hot sauce to eat oh, oh. and then everyone would be like bloated afterwards. <laughs> but anyway. Um, That's yeah, another you, difference you're... between the food food when you're a student <laughs> and you're an architect. You that's can afford big, better food. Yeah, that's the biggest one. No, you can't. <laughs> you can't. It's going to be the same. Um, 
you know, that's a really good point that the the who is about who it is about is different in school. It's about you um, much more than in, in reality. And, and, and in reality, like you said, it's, it's not about you. It's about everyone else that's going to experience the building. And it's about the building itself. Like yeah. no one gives a shit about anything other than the building, the final, final building that gets constructed and how it affects people. That's the only thing that matters. And you know, even if in school you're being taught that you're designing for maybe uh, three families to live in this multifamily building, or you're designing a school for children who are handicapped or whatever, you know, the exercise is about, it's all fictional, right? You have to imagine, but between the fiction and the actual projection and understanding of what that would mean in a real situation. Yeah. I mean, this is really hard to understand. It gets much more complicated you know, in reality. It's really hard to understand. I, and I think this highlights another issue of like, okay, but what's the balance? Because we're, we're, we seem to be saying that but we still should think conceptually and produce concepts and think about your own, um, I call them biases, right? Preferences and like your artistic vision. As you as a particular human being, you are special, you are unique <laughs> most of the time. Like, what do you bring to the table, mm -hmm. right? And that's on, on 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 one hand. On the other hand, you have the realities of the context of the building, and you have to re, you have to be responsible and re respond to those, right? And produce some things that um, have value to the people and all that stuff. So, how, and a lot of times these are not perfectly in line, and there's kind of a give and take between the two. And how do you find the balance? That's the tricky part. I think that's also why you know going back to the question of concepts and their validity. Um, if we just educated people and uh, future architects in the practical way of like you got to respond to all these things like okay let me show me tell me what your budget is now tell me what you're this or this or that like we would produce uh we would end up producing non-creatives we produce people who are more like robots technicians yeah and um that's the of course that's the rub that's the, the the special thing about this profession is you need to do both and one is always trying to engulf the other yeah, yeah. you know what i mean like the the conceptual part if you allow yourself to have too much of an ego, the artistic part of oneself, the artist, that will take over all the things that you need to pay attention to to be responsible and to produce good architecture. On the other hand, if you allow the practical constraints to take over, then you've produced just another generic thing. I mean, you know, I I, I understand why you know um, architecture school is is kind of a kind of an incubator. Mm -hmm. Right, you're kind of like in this bubble for like four or five years, trying to learn all the things there is to learn and you know, like develop your creative mind and critical mind and all of that stuff. Therefore, you can't really have too many like germs coming in your bubble that would eventually like, you know, distort where you're trying to, yeah. where you're trying to birth, right? Yeah, like of course. you can't, you can't do that. Um, and it's, and it's much easier, I really believe for most people, human beings to become more constrained at our thinking than to be more open because we're always looking for security. And when you are responding to specific constraints and you're told you cannot deviate from these constraints, that provides security, right? So it's a, it's a security blanket. You don't have to invent things from scratch. Um, going back to what I was saying about in school, because things are much more philosophical, as you put it, um, therefore the thinking is much higher level and more abstract. Mm -hmm. um, that's different from practice. So I would just, within that part of the con uh, conversation, I would describe practice as being equally challenging but in com the complete opposite way most of the time in that the problems you're solving in practice most often are not that complicated really in this scale of what we're used to as designers and architects they're not very complicated what? but there's a gajillion of them and it requires mm -hmm. a lot of coordination um not dedication like uh, persistence you know so I, I would kind of decide describe school as like you're, you're looking at a few a fewer number of really deep complex philosophical questions and you're going down this rabbit hole of like all this crazy thinking that's intertwined and stuff right and that requires a lot of really high level abstract thinking in practice it's not really the case it's more like simple question simple simple problem to solve then another then another then another until you basically it's a question of um, endurance i think again yeah and i mean it also depends you know what kind of practice like if yep, that's you, true. you know like if your issues are only tangible and technical issues on like how to resolve something to get built, it's fairly straightforward. If your office is focusing in changing policies or like trying to develop 
things that don't exist, like new typologies or whatever, that's much more complicated. Yeah. And, you know, n neither or is good or bad, but if you think of maybe the biggest architects or figures in architecture, right, they were kind of doing both. Doing both. They yeah. were big thinkers, they had big ideas, and they were still like building stuff and getting it done, right? But there is always yeah. this kind of like back and forth, yeah. like there is ways with what we do where we could push things in much further directions yeah. than just responding to what's being asked. And um, that's again, that's what separates the great architects from the good ones. I'm not saying there, there's anything wrong with being a good architect. We need more just good architects for sure. But um, you, you got to try and do both. But so I think being aware that there are these patterns where people tend to go, they choose an avenue, right? The left or the right side, let's say. Um, that's where you get into trouble. And you don't, and you know, some you meet oftentimes people like students who just graduated. And they started working, and they had all these big dreams when they were in school and designing those like crazy stuff, or like they have big questions on how to make the world a better place. And then they start working, and they realize like, you know, how down to earth, yeah, you know how like how down to earth that is, and it's not really like suiting them. Well, you don't have to pick one side or the other. Like you could try to keep doing both yeah that's the struggle and that goes back to the pace of projects right mm -hmm. like you, you can't lose focus of the bigger goal which is to create great architecture capital g capital a architecture and that is like i would describe so i i could probably fairly easily describe what it takes to be a successful architecture student right um and there's a certain certain things for that what it takes to be a successful architect is not the same thing and a lot of it, I think, comes down to the the timeline of projects. Like it takes a, a different well, a level successful, of you know. This is true, but I think it it it, it takes a, a different level of of um, like self management in a longer term uh, to become to be a successful architect, practicing architect. Uh, in school, you can kind of like you know pound your way through. <laughs> then, uh, then party, then pound your way through, and then do well. You, you, there's a limit to how much you can do that in practice because of various things. Um, I think maybe also we should touch upon that the, the growth of an individual is very different from school versus practice. And to me, one of the big difficulties, <laughs> to me, one of the, I'm having a real trouble speaking this morning with these retainers. I don't, I don't know why. Sometimes it's a challenge, sometimes. It's still a challenge. It's always a challenge, even without the retainers. Um, Your tongue's too big. It is. It is too big. I hurt my tongue, and now it's kind of um, inflated. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so personal growth. I think what's interesting is that in an academic setting, the challenge is keeping up with the growth that is expected expected of you, right? It's keeping up with the amount of knowledge you're supposed to acquire. The knowledge that's being forced upon you. That's the challenge, right? In practice, it's sort of the opposite because no one is going to voluntarily make you grow once you get outside of the university bubble. You have to go find obstacles and challenges and over overcome those to learn, right? So I would kind of describe school as being this obstacle course you have to get through, right? And every obstacle you get through is a way you, a new unit of knowledge you learn. But because of the schedule of school, it's a set schedule, you're being pushed through this obstacle course. And so your objective, there are these hurdles. Your objective is to try and get over these hurdles or around these hurdles as cleanly as possible to learn the most. And sometimes you miss a few because you, you didn't, you're not organized or whatever. That's what it's like. You're being pushed through this obstacle course of like learning. In practice, no one is pushing you. There's no schedule. There's no, there's no, you know, what is it? First semester, second semester, summer break. There's, there's no schedule, right? It's just forever working. And there's no obstacles in front of you either. You have to go find those things. You have to go out to like someplace, find an obstacle, run around it and go to the next one and choose your own pace. And so learning and the growth for a lot of people in school is very rapid and 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 they they shoot up in a certain way but after they graduate they kind of plateau because there isn't the system that's designed to help you do that but it's also kind of like anything that's new like a new relationship you know like you're super excited about dating this guy for like you know the first six months because you know nothing about 
you know, no, you know nothing about him, right? So you're discovering it as you go, and then after a while, like, okay, you get the drill, you know. Uh, <laughs> so no, but you know what I mean. Okay. It's like in school, right. everything is brand new, so that you're right. a sponge, and there's so much to absorb that you're overwhelmed with that, right? And now, and after that, once you start working for like a year or two in an office. You understand you understand how it works and and you could just kind of like be comfortable yeah. with that or you can maybe move offices and challenge yourself to like you said like challenge what you know challenge what you, who you are what what you've been doing where you want to go right um yeah yeah no that, exactly it, it it's it's all the knowledge is focused on you in the university and not only that you have people pushing you so even if you're successful in, in school you're still gonna you're still gonna have teachers and critics that are pushing you harder and harder to try different things to go further etc and um there's it, no coach there's no coach in offices exactly yeah unless you have yeah. bosses who are extremely interested in, you, in your you know career development and, and all of that like it's it's on you well, that's a good point, though, because <clears throat> that leads us to the people you're surrounded by, right? Um, in school, you're surrounded by educators. Now, I, I would say that a lot of design teachers are not very good. A lot of architecture teachers are actually not very good. But still, if they're teaching even part-time, they've dedicated a significant portion of their life to, to teaching. And they're always thinking about them. So teachers will sit down and talk and question, how do we teach? How do we impart knowledge better? How do we ensure the six, future success, success of these students better, right? There's been a, they, that's their life. Their life is to do that, right? To help these people. And so you have these coaches you're surrounded by all the time in school. In practice, you don't have that. You have a boss and a good boss will think like a teacher, I think. But most partners of offices, uh, most founders of offices, employers, they did not start an office thinking, I want to learn, I want to be the best boss and help impart knowledge on future generations. They start an office because they're working somewhere else. They got a side project. They got a few more side projects, and they're like, "Oh, I'm making a little more money." Well, it's a business. It's I guess not I could do school. this. And so then, twenty years go by, and so that's a lot of times like when you have an employer, that's the person you're dealing with. You're not dealing with someone who dedicated their life to thinking about how to educate someone or help people. No, because that's not what you sign up for. You sign up for a job, and the the money is the thing that's running, not the knowledge and the, and the education. And and you know like. When you talk to people about uh, whether or not a person should start their own practice, some people will say um, you should start your own practice if you want to do your own thing, meaning you want to have more design control uh, control over the project. Others will say that's a terrible idea. If that's that's your reason for starting a practice, don't start a practice. Start a practice because you want to have financial independence. Others will say start a practice because you want to be a good leader. Very few, actually, almost no one says that. <laughs> and others will say start a practice because you're you are you're wanting to get projects and work with clients, right? And the majority of those reasons have nothing to do with again being a good boss necessarily, right? It's self-centered. I wanted to have more design control, or I want to be the one who goes out and gets my own projects and get, gets more money. What does that have to do with teaching or educating, right? But again, being an architect is, is not being a teacher. So it's a different thing. The, I mean, the other thing too is that the big difference between architecture school and architecture offices is that when you're in school, you have coaches. And basically what that means, you have parents. Mm -hmm. you're, you're a kid, right? Mm -hmm. You get out of school, you're an adult, you're on your own. Like your boss is not your parent. Your boss might be your parent, but it's like your parent when you're 50 years old and your parents are not parenting anymore, right? Like <laughs> you should be rolling on your own. You should yeah. be figuring out this stuff on your own. Um, so that's a big difference. I think it's you're you're independent in school. You're dependent. You're dependent on on your parents to go to school. You're dependent on your teachers to learn. You're dependent on your peers to communicate and interact with you. Right. You're dependent of everything around you. Yeah, it's like everyone's giving you these like little power ups, and you don't even you don't really recognize it yet because probably you're too young. You know, everyone's yeah. solving all these problems for you. You're not really aware. They're taking these problems off the table so you can focus on other things right yeah and i mean you know i feel like it's probably the difference between the school and the and the profession is probably the same in many other fields oh yeah unless you're practicing you're learning a job that is exactly what you're going to be doing after you graduate there is this you know this kind of this 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 big void in between the two that no one prepares you for and you just got to be ready for that I think the gap is even greater in our profession because of the complexity of what we do and the fact that architecture is responding and and responsible for, to, to so many different parties and things yeah it's you know, very it's, complex it's complex um i think also a big difference is that 
the, the amount of responsibility you have um, in school versus in practice. You know, for undergrad students or even grad students, you can get away with a lot. I'm talking, I, what I mean is that you can show up late to a presentation, you can produce crappy work, you can have not done the work, and you can still get by. And grades are inflated crazy, you know, now. So, like, you could do barely any work and probably get, like, an A- in a lot of top-tier universities. Like, people might not know this, like, top-tier universities, you could probably get by with a B plus, A- in every single design studio and it'd be do mediocre work right and there's a number of reasons for that but but that's the case and the main one is well you're the one paying the school so <laughs> they're not yeah, I know. <laughs> you it's, know yeah they're not gonna make you fail yeah you're paying them you're the reason why they're there yeah, so. they don't want to look bad right but anyway so what i'm saying is that in practice if you're working at an office you can't do that that's not even a question right if the if your employer says tomorrow i need to see three options for this there is no way you, unless you lose a limb, there is no way you are not going to show up to work and have those three options. Yeah, you might be 15 minutes late. Everyone's a little bit later now and then, but there's no way you're not going to do the work and do the work at the quality that is expected or higher. One, because our, most architects are dedicated, but the the what's at stake is much higher. If you don't do those three options, I'll just fire you. <laughs> there, there are plenty of there's a lot of young architects and designers out there who are wanting to take your spot if you're at a good office and there is no way you're not going to do their work in school it's amazing to me what students do to get a, out get away from doing their work oh i wasn't feeling sort of well for the last three months so, oh you know like no one cares oh my computer crashed oh, no one cares you will produce the work oh. I, I lo the drawings got lost then reproduce them in the last two minutes and pin something up like there are zero options for not doing the work in practice and but that's it's funny because to me the, the roles difference. are flipped the roles are flipped the roles are flipped when you're in school you're paying the teacher you're paying the score so you are the client you are the one like you're in control you're in, in control like people respond to you in a way right in 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 in, in at work well <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're not the client you're yeah. working for the client so you don't have that kind of power let's say yeah and um that shift, you know, when you cross that line from from being in school and you graduate and then you cross the line into to working at an office, it's interesting because people who were, were always having excuses, suddenly they have no more excuses. <laughs> you know, but how much, uh, as much as you disagree with me on like doing internship when you're in school, I think in some ways it's a way to have a tiny door open to how things actually are going to work out after, mm -hmm. you know, um, and kind of understanding that it's not about you and you have to respond to people who have responsibility and stuff like that. It's, I think it's important. I mean, a good employer is sympathetic and they're, they're good people and humans and they're caring. So I don't want to make it sound like all of the architecture partners out there are like heartless, but, um, you are not their priority. You're just not, I mean, the, 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 and this is gets to another thing, maybe the next thing. The priority is the client. The priority is the building which the client owns or is paying for, and therefore is you know the building of the client. Or those are the two things that are the priority. Yeah, um, and you know, and if you are at a certain lower level in the office, you're replaceable. Yeah. So you know, if you don't bring what they're hiring you for, they're just going to replace you with someone else. Yeah, uh, you're you're right. The roles are. I, I almost hate to say this because I don't want. St <laughs> Sometimes I feel like students think they have more power than they than they. I want them to think even though they do have that power in some ways because like well i'm going to give you a lower grade well what does that matter to you if you're not going to go to grad school why do you give a shit? you know um so i don't want people thinking that because i have to deal with these people <laughs> but um it's it's true like you, you know as a student you are paying the university and like they can reprimand you by giving you a lower grade but that's not the same thing as 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 the stakes are a lot, those stakes are lower compared to, okay, if you don't do your work, I will fire you and you won't have money to pay for your rent, your food, and maybe your kids. Like, oh shit, no, I'm going to do the work, you know? And, um, I don't know, I, w I wish students would have that kind of attitude <laughs> in school. It'd make my life easier. Well, if you don't go to, I don't know, if you go to a European school, well, it's 500 bucks a year. School doesn't give a shit if you know <laughs> how much you pay. It's like That's if your true. project sucks, you're just gonna have a low grade and you're gonna have yeah. to deal with it, you know? That's true. Um, okay, talking about process, 
uh, the design process and stuff and teamwork, I think, is a big one. Teamwork. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know, that's one thing, too. Again, learning architecture in a bubble, you have to remember it's not about you and you're not going to be the only one on the on the project to figure it out. And you do some teamwork exercise in school, but oftentimes you can choose who your team is and your team is fairly contained. Like, I don't know, maybe we're talking about three, five people at most, right? Or everybody's doing the same site model for the project so that the whole class is involved. But, oh, you know, what a mess. I hate that. It, well, that happens a yeah. lot because, you know, it's trying to be efficient, but it's also super inefficient because students can, can organize themselves. So, you know, you have a little bit of, of teamwork, but... It's very accommodating teamwork in a way. When you start working in an office, your team is bigger. It's it's a team within your own office where you're working at. It's a team with consultants working with the client and the client's team. And it's a team of people you don't have the choice to deal with or not. No. You can be like, I don't like the mechanical engineer. I don't want him. I want the other guy. Like, no, that's it. Like you have to make it work. Um and it's very different. It's very different. And you and your you know, your position within that team, there is a, a lot more hierarchy there in, than in school where everybody's at the same level. Yeah. Way, right. Everybody's equal to equal. Well, so so um uh, yeah, I think we can compare school teamwork and school uh, group projects versus architecture, which is always a group project. I think also though the school and for the most part it's a very um you know, solo practice uh for them you might have you have group exercises like you described in school? yeah but in school yeah, you basically it's, it's, it's not, all about you no. it's like what are your skill sets what are you able to do what are you able to accomplish how how can you organize ideas that you come up everything is is within your control for this project the studio project and that's a great learning exercise um but that's the fascinating thing is it's it's more like you're an artist when you're in school and you're you're a sculptor or something it's just you and your clay it's just you and your computer and, and the people you have to print through or the models. That's it. And that's a, skill, that's a skill that would be interesting in learning in school, being able to manage people or manage things. Yeah. You know, that's not something that's being taught, which is why there's a lot of very terrible project managers out there who just don't know how to deal with multiple things or people. But you're right. Like, it's always kind of a first-person perspective in school, the way we do projects, mm -hmm. right? Um or it's like we're all equal and we're all working equally on the project, but there is not really a hierarchy. Like it would be very interesting, let's say if you were in a studio and you know you had like three groups of students and each group had like a project leader, uh, you know, like a technician or like, you know, like different roles. So you kind of understand yeah. and, and move around and get a, not a taste, but like kind of test your own skills on, on those things. So, so. What that means is that in school, it's more about your individual skill set and capabilities. In practice, the success, so another way to put it is that the success of a project in school is like 95% determined by your own abilities mm -hmm. and what you do. The success of a building in practice is determined uh, by many things and your own skill set as a designer is probably only like I don't know thirty percent or something or half, depending on how you think how important design is. But it's it's a small fraction because there's a lot of other things that have to a lot of teamwork involved that makes it successful. There's many other people that have to be really good at their jobs, and you have to convince them to do their job correctly and et cetera, et cetera, to get the building to work. So uh, you know, like you said, management and teamwork and 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 conversing with people is. Some days, it depends on the phase you're in, obviously. It feels like it's 90% of the job. In certain phases, it's 100% of the job. And, you know, you will notice when offices are hiring, one of the, their criteria is, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically play nice with, is is a team player, yeah. right? If, if you're a person who only works in their own bubble, like, no one wants to hire that. It doesn't work. You can't do architecture that way. You Again, know? you can't do real architecture as in buildings. If you're doing an art installation, you know, you're making things out of wood sticks on your own. Yeah, fine, whatever. But I don't. That's not a building. If you're doing a building, there's a lot of people involved. I will say though that one of the differences between school teamwork and, uh, I guess, professional teamwork, is that I would actually describe it in the opposite way you did, where school teamwork, um, you don't really have an option. Like, 
like I think for me at least, a lot of times you are assigned a team, or even if, even if you choose a team, um, you're you're in the context of a, of a class, right? You have no option but to work with these people to get the project done, and the leverage you have over each other is very minimal. It's like do a good job so we can get a good grade, but you can't force the person to to do their portion of the work. That's why like when you do the class site models, it's always a shit show, and like half the people don't do the work because there's no leverage. Honestly, as a teacher, that's the thing I hate the most. I wish I had I wish I had more leverage over the students. That that sounds mean, but like, how do I push them otherwise, right? In 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 the professional setting, you have much more leverage because if someone is really fucking up. And and the teamwork, the team is structured correctly. You would go to the client and say, "Hey, this guy is doing a really bad job. We got to find a different person." And you can swap them out if it gets to that point, you know. Yeah. Or you you harass them and you push them to do it. And you you don't. That's also where, you know, if you're the client, you have ultimate leverage because what's on the line is you're going to be fired. And depending on how closely the architect works with the client, the architect has a little bit of that say as well because it's like I'm. The client's um, what do you call it? Agent in a sense, mm -hmm. right? I I don't in my bank have their money. I'm not funding the project, but they're trusting me to make decisions. And I'm telling you, as the you know right hand of the client, you are not doing a job. Get your shit together, right? Um. So there's a little more. You can get people to do more in a professional setting because of the threat of being fired yeah. and also because of their reputation people make this is their livelihood supposedly right that they make money and they support their families by do by with their profession of, of being a metal worker or whatever if they don't do a good job and you are a successful practice who has a reputation and you're connected that means they will get less work from you in the beginning and even less work if you go around telling other people do not work with these people they're unprofessional da, 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 da. In school, you have none of that. Why do you? Why do you care as a student? You're gonna be out in like three years, you know. Yeah. So, the teamwork thing is is very different between the two settings. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think the idea of a project management course would be is pretty fascinating. Well, you know, even someone like paying clients, uh, the only kind of exposure you have as a student to like what maybe a client would say to you is that a review. You know, when you have a critic that just like brings something that's mm -hmm. kind of like okay, well. But that's that's it. Like there is no the other side is never talking to you, you know. Yeah, I know. It's weird. I know. And, and in school, we can make up these rules. We have a site boundary, and here's a setback, right? We have you, a program. You have you have the zoning in this for this thing. You have a yeah. program, right? You have a client. You're gonna go talk to people who are in the community who are like real clients. But it's still all. It's like you're playing house. I don't yeah, know if you have it in France. Yeah, yeah. And your kids, yeah, you play. Yeah. You make up rules. You, they're rules, but they're not really rules. Yeah. You know, like is there, is there a different weight to them when, if you don't adhere to the zoning code, you just don't get approved. Period. It won't. You won't. It doesn't get built. <laughs> like it's yeah. not the same thing in school. It's like, are you within the site boundary? And this is a mid review. Ah! It's like, okay, fix that. But let's talk about all this other stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Like, if you were working on a real project and you had a client meeting and you're halfway through the project and they were like, does this fit within the site boundary? Or I'm like, ah, they wouldn't say, well, let's talk about the other things. They'd be like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'm about to fire you, right? Like, you yeah. wasted all my time and money. Um, process and outcome is another thing I wrote down. And this is sort of similar to what we're talking about right now. In school, there's much more concern with the process because it's an educational environment um so we're concerned about so there's a couple ways to, to 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 understand what i mean by that we're concerned with process one is that in school we're concerned with the the work of the process meaning the diagrams the drawings the presentations all of that stuff right i don't necessarily mean that although that's that's true what i mean by process is that because it's an educational environment the entire institution and the world you live within is much more concerned about your growth which is process. So, like for most teachers, if a project in the end is not great, but the student learned a lot, you would take that into account when grading. You know, that matters a lot. Or even if they did not do well in the end, but they worked really, really hard and had some trouble and they overcame those adversities, that counts for a lot. So the process and the growth is this like, accounts for a significant portion of what matters. In practice, no one gives a fuck about any of that, right? I don't care how hard you work from the client. I don't really care how hard you worked. 
I don't really care about like all the different drawings you did and stuff. I might find it interesting because I have an interest in that, and I might find it valuable because I have an interest in it, right? So I'm getting some kind of knowledge out of it, but really, no. But again, that's because, you know, practice is not school. Yeah. You know, practice is a business. And what matters is how much you're bringing to the business. Yeah. You know, in any job, no one cares about your personal development. Like, not really. Unless you're, I don't even know what profession would care about that. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. like, yeah. It, it's an exchange of, of goods. I give you money against, you know, you give me. Uh, your services, yeah. your design services. And, and and there's levels. I mean, of course, like employers should care about growth. Of course, cl yeah. uh, I mean, I don't know why clients would care because it's not their organization. But like, y you have to think about, you know, bottom line, what is the most important thing in this setting? In school, it's education, right? Uh, and, and future success, not current success, future success in practice it's not education. The, 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 the most important thing that matters most is whatever the client says, right? And they don't really care about your growth or your education. And they don't really care about your future success in a lot of cases. They care about the product, the building, the final physical building that's there. When it's done, I can see it. I can touch it. I can feel it. People are using it. That's what I care about. And so another way to look at the two differences between school and, and practice is like who's in charge? Who, who is the person who has final say, which dictates everything down below? In school, it tends to be the teacher, right? Yeah, obviously there's a teacher and then there's like department head or chair and then there's a dean, but, but for the designer, for the student, for the architect, it's the teacher. If the teacher likes it or they approve it or whatever, that's all that matters, right? In the context of when you're doing a project. It's a little bit different in practice because you have a boss, but you're but your boss, your architecture boss, is not actually the boss. The client is the boss in the sense that they're the ones who have final say, yes or no, I like it, I don't like it, or we're going to change things, or this project is scrapped for reasons outside of, reasons that you know, might not even have to do with you at all, right? And so it's a little bit weird, actually, also, that reminds me that in school, it's a mistake that students make. They, they seek approval from their teachers. I don't, they mm -hmm. really shouldn't be doing that, but that's, that's, you know, it's there. That's what happens. Um, Safety blanket. Yeah, in a way. Um, and that can be a bad thing. It can also be a good thing. Like you should listen to your teacher, hopefully, if they're a good one. And when you're working at an office, you, the same thing happens with your boss or your partner, right? And there's levels, levels, levels. That's why there's when there's more hierarchy in an office, the more frustrating it is for designers because you create something, you show it to your your design director, and you're looking for their approval because then you can go home, <laughs> right? They approve it. Then they go up to their, uh, let's say, the uh, the partner, right? They need their approval, so then they can go home. <laughs> and then the partner needs to present it to the client, right? And so it's like you can produce something at your desk, and then there's like three layers above you mm -hmm. where you can get dismissed, and you not you might not even be part of those conversations. And that's another thing from a, more of a first-person perspective, what it feels like. It's different. And I think the, the more... <laughs> I think the more that employees realize that that's the case, they think about that, the more new practices we would have. <laughs> because you know, like for us, we have our own office. So the only person we have to, you know, get approval from is the client. Now, I, I would say that getting approval doesn't does not sound right. And I would actually argue the opposite. Because otherwise, why is the client hiring you if you're not the expert? But we only respond, we only, uh, what do you call it, take it up or whatever with yeah. one person. We don't have to talk to one person. It's the client, right? The client might have a few people on the team, but that's it. There is a lot of, you know, in practices, like time wasted and then bad decisions being made just because of those different chain of commands yeah. that can agree with each other or, or that have other things involved, such as ego and power um, beyond what the design needs to be so there's a lot of bullshit in offices probably less bullshit in school in a way because like you said the exchange is more direct between one side and the other the teacher and the student um you know when you enter the business world there's a lot more bullshit <laughs> a lot more bullshit and there's politics yep. there's politics in school but again the relationship and how successful you are even in the context of a studio where there's other people that are also trying to be 
um, you know, successful. And and I hate to say, but usually the way the grading works is like you only want to give out a certain number of of each grade. So there's a little bit of like, so if you have all stellar students, maybe they're all good aides, but a lot of times it's like, well, it's relative. If this person gets an A, then this person can't get an A. Any other course though, you know, if they're surrounded by lesser students, then that person would have gotten an A kind of thing. Um, but, but, but even with that, it's still like, it's just, it's very individual and direct. It's about you and yeah. the teacher, you and the teacher. In practice, you moving up in the office, Right, not just I'm not just talking about like the, your designs getting uh, going through and your drawings getting approved, like I was talking about before. But you moving up in the office to get raises and things has much more to do with uh, the politics and all the networking of the social networking in the place. <clears throat> well, so the growth, you know, from going to school from school to uh, practice is also interesting because. As you move through your five years of architecture school, right, you start from being the freshman to being the oldest in the school and the one with the most knowledge compared to the other students, right? Mm -hmm. Then you leave school, you enter the, the professional world, and you're starting back from zero. You're nobody. Which is, it's kind of a frustrating process, you know, it's like you go to elementary school and then you start like, what is it, the next one up? Oh, middle it's school. Middle school. Yeah, middle school, yeah. right? Like you're like the the big guy in elementary school, and then you enter middle school, and you're like the young, the kid, the one that nobody respects and no one cares about, right? Yeah. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, it takes a little time to get adjusted to that. Yeah. Um, I will and, say, and 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 the the growing process to go back to where you left off once you start working takes much more time, much more effort, and it's not always really up to you in a way like it's it's not or it's not even a clear path on how to get it's there not a clear path. you know um that's the other thing too is that the path that's a good way to describe it the path is pretty clear for you in school it's right? been traced for you before it's been you traced even for you it. and like and almost like the the way to be successful is almost quite clear so like in in the states especially i think high school there's a certain game to it and once you learn how to play that game, um, you can become successful. It still takes a lot of hard work. Like it's, it's crazy the amount of work you have to do to, to you know, get A's and then be in this special class. Uh, what is it called? Um, AP courses and next for like all this stuff you have to do to prepare for college. But there's a certain kind of rhythm to it, and once you understand that, you you can have much more success easily. And then I remember that when I transitioned to college. Um, it was a it was a new system, so you're not only lower on the food chain, you know, socially and skill wise and everything else, mm -hmm. but there's like a different system you have to get used to. And um, by the time you get to third, fourth, or fifth year, you know that system really well. You're like, yeah, I I run the school, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then you graduate, and as you're describing, it's a it's a different system again, but the pond that you're within, it's not like you. So I would say, okay, so how do I describe? So like elementary school, you're in a small pond. You're like a backyard pond that's like 10 feet wide <laughs> with some koi or something. And then like, uh, like my, my backyard. <laughs> college, you're in like a, a lake, you know, a, lake a, a, a decent sized lake, um, a, a small lake, I would say. And then uh, once you graduate and you're out in the world, you're swimming in the Pacific Ocean. Like the difference between the system, in quotes, between college and the real world is so massive that it's you can't... It, 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 to the even now, there are days where I struggle to comprehend what that system is and how I should move and maneuver through it, because there's no one helping to guide you. And this is the system of life. It's the system of it's the matrix, but but no, really, because the 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 opportunities and the potentials and the different paths you can go down are nearly infinite, and I think the problem is that somehow with university. <laughs> I don't know what I'm calling university. Only, only the British say university. We don't say that in the United States. In college and in high school, we are trained to look for what that system is so we can be successful and adopt a certain pattern of behavior. And the, the boundaries. I want to know the limits it's of this game. It's your computerized testing system type of mentality. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. The standardized test. No, you, I, I <laughs> the think... The thing you, I never... It's like, it makes no sense for me coming from like where I come from. It, 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 it never existed. Like, I, I think that's what it, I think there's some of that though. And so you're looking for those boundaries, yeah. right? Again, as a sort of a comfort zone. And the, the danger is that when you graduate and you're practicing, 
you're in the ocean, but you're still looking for these boundaries, and then you glob on to this one office, right? And that becomes your new system. And you learn how to be successful within it, how to communicate with people and whatever, how to climb the ladder, and that becomes your world. And I think that's a real tragedy because no, that's not the world. That's not, that shouldn't be your world either. That's one speck out of everything. And by the way, most practices aren't run correctly. And by the way, they produce probably media work and they're surrounded by a bunch of politics and partners who didn't want to educate or be good leaders. Get out, do your own thing. <laughs> or don't, don't do your own thing. Change office, look for another job. Or that's an, an easier, you know, hop from island to island or whatever. I think that's one of the, the, the danger of coming out of school is thinking that, okay, you're just gonna basically take the first path you found and just stay on for too long. Yeah. You know, um, like you should be defining your own path and, and you, you should figure it out yourself. It's challenging though. There's a lot of risk that comes with that. You have to be willing to... It's challenging, to, but at the same time, it's what everybody does in any profession in life in general. Like, yeah, you know, I, th I think a lot of this discussion applies to many, many you other know, like our parents but... probably no one told them what their path should be, and they figured it out, right? I love being an adult is just figuring it out. Or again, they adhere to preconceptions of what things should be. Yep. Whether it be off work related or life related, which I don't want to get into since this is a fellow designer, but you know, work related, you fall into these pre the boundaries of preconceptions mm -hmm. because of what other people are telling you to do or you think it should be. And you know, the difference I think between practicing a, especially as your own architect versus not is you're gambling on yourself. You're making you're placing a huge bet, right? And the risk is you could lose a lot of things. But um, you're 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 betting yourself, you're betting on yourself, right? In school, you're you're not really betting on yourself again because you're in like a you're in a like a bounce out, like it's safe, everything's cushioned for you. And even when you're working at an office, it's still super highly 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 structured, you know. Um, so that that's that's what I think one of the big differences between being in college versus not. I'm trying to think there are probably some really obvious differences between architecture school versus the practice that we haven't hit on. Um, well, I think, you know, a lot of architects who are practicing would say that the main one is the difference in the work, right? Like we're dealing with building codes and money, budget, schedule, things that no one tells you. You know, maybe the I, I, the idea that you have that what the profession is like, mm -hmm. or maybe I don't know how much money you think you're gonna make, right? Those kind of like big taboo, mystery thing that you know are not necessarily brought up to the attention of students. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, like uh, you know, one thing that I know, you know, it's kind of maybe repeating. Uh, we talked about that many times. Is like. In school, students should be warned on maybe how much they should be expected to make mm -hmm. and the numbers that they should refuse to work for. You know, you come out of school, if you don't know anyone in the profession and you know nothing, you get a job, that's a big accomplishment, right? Like it's your first job, but if the numbers are ridiculously small, that's insulting and students should know about it. and. It could potentially help the profession in its whole. So, well, the issue is that students don't even know what numbers are considered high or considered low. They don't even know right? what to expect. And so, you graduate and you're told, "Well, oh, I'm going to pay you fifty thousand dollars a year." It's like, wow. It depends on where you live. I know. But fifty thousand dollars a year, <gasps> I could buy like a Tesla with that money. It's like, oh wait, no. Taxes take off depending on where you live. Take off like thirty percent. Okay, so you're down to I don't know what. Thirty thousand dollars, twenty eight thousand dollars, or whatever it might be, right? Yeah, and you're going to work ninety hours a week, and you know you then you have paid insurance, over time. and you have this and that. You know, so, yeah. so, yeah, and th and that's more of a question of like, how do you prepare for for going out there after you after yeah. you graduate? Um, I think really though, again, from the first person perspective, like the things you can expect when you've graduated, again, is the, the hierarchy of offices. I think that's a, a really big one. And I think um, it all comes down to two things to me, the person in charge and how long things take. And everything else is basically a ripple effect of those two facts. You know, the other thing is that we were talking about um, how in school projects are much more philosophical and theoretical than maybe the real ones, let's say, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And, 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 and that's true. And I think both worlds could use of each other, mm -hmm. right? Like 
you could use more philosophical, more philosophy in, in design process in offices to come yeah. up with stuff. Agreed. But also I think, um, you know, school could use maybe more of the pragmatic side of working on real projects. So it's not, all, you know, like, I don't know, some schools, like students do work that's so insanely unrealistic and, and almost like fantasy world that I'm like, it's good. Like, I love creation. I love things that you're, you know, coming up with everything from zero that's so different that it's it's questioning what reality we live in. And that's great. Mm -hmm. But also, like, how far can you go in that direction before you're like way far off? Uh, you know what the profession is going to be about and if you want to be a paper architect or a dreamer or or another sort of designer that's perfectly fine but if you're trying to still be an architect when you come out of school the gap is going to be huge you're going to have a tough time <laughs> and you might just find one office that does that type of work you know well the thing is you're going to have so tough of a time that most people will quit they won't do it and they'll still claim to be an architect to like hold on to this idea they're an architect get over yourself you're not an architect it's fine not to be an architect yeah call yourself an architectural researcher it's fine to be that but if we were talking the other night with somebody and i was we were talking about these different schools uh, we were speaking with actually a really one of the best architects i know and um we were discussing the different types of universities and some are much more theoretical and you said there's they're, they're, they're in a complete fantasy land yeah and all of us like or at least the two of us like we acknowledge like that has value fine but do not call yourself an architect. You are not an architect. I don't care if you're licensed either. I mean, I guess then you'd be legally an architect, but you're not <laughs> making buildings. You're not trying to make buildings, right? So no, stop. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it honestly, we talk about trying to establish our value to society, right? To demonstrate our value. You are devaluing us when you do this nonsense, mm -hmm. then you're claiming it's architecture. You, you're 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 creating a bigger gap between us and everyone else. You can say like, "Hey, we're the architectural researchers. We're helping develop this side of architecture, so that architects may use that and better their work." Yes, good. But to say that you're an architect next to this other architect who's done ten buildings, no, you're not. This other architect might be a bad one, but they're an architect. <laughs> you know what I mean? They are an architect. But I think but, so, so, so. Yeah, but so I think it's probably easier to. Um, inject some uh, theory or philosophy into a design practice and architecture practice mm -hmm. because there's different ways you could go about that that are not uh, constraining too much and that actually help developing the process but but at the contrary if you try to inject practice into um, architecture school I feel like it's tricky it's tricky to be done well yeah. You know, it's either like, oh, today we're going to talk about sustainable materials. And it's in a very superficial, no one cares about way, right? That's like useless. Or, you know, I don't know, we're going to inject the ARE exam while you're in school so you can learn about what practice is going to be like. Well, no, the ARE is its own thing. Like it's an added on thing, completely made up. That's not bridging the gap between school and practice. It's just sucking in the money you know, and in, in your your lifetime. <laughs> I almost feel like it's like, uh, this is, it's like cuisine. Like there's a certain meal that's been prepared and someone says, you know, like the audience, the final consumers of this, they have more of an American kind of taste to it or uh, yeah, American taste. So we, we're going to have to kind of figure out a way to have it be appeal to them too and not right. just be totally weird. And it's like, okay, boom, I throw a hamburger on top of the dish. It's like, yeah, okay, that's like really sloppy. <laughs> Like, oh, okay, how about we do hamburgers for appetizers, then we move on to the raw fish for the main course. It's like, ah, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't think it's a you good idea. You need finesse, right? Like, <laughs> I know. You need finesse. You need things to blend. You need flavor to, like, help each other. It's not, yeah, yeah it's not you just slam the burger on the table and cut it a day. And I feel like oftentimes that's kind of how practice is injected into school. It's like, okay, check that off. We talked about practice this way. Good enough. It's right? also a lot, a lot of ways that that, that um, more theoretical things are injected in practice, right? Um, like you had said earlier, a lot of practices will say they have concepts, but it's more of a way to appeal to clients or to market or to appear a certain way. And that's another aspect too that you don't think about as a student is, is that in practice, you know, half of your job if you're an owner is to get work and it's to appeal to people, to convince people that you have value. And, um, you know, you can be the starving artist and just assume that people are going to flock to you because of how great you are, but that's 
realistically not going to happen. It's, I don't. I think now it's even worse than before. So um, there's this other dimension. And so anyway, so yeah, I think a lot of practice says it's like, oh yeah, we we think conceptually, or we have these Fridays where we take field trips to here or there, but it's more of a box they have to check and in, in how they're solving it. You know, uh, the same thing within school. Like, okay, boom, we've been we've put in some of the exams. Boom, we that have or, internships. or worse yeah. even scenario is that they find a gimmick that works for every single project and that's the concept and the concept is yeah, get out of here. not a concept and yeah. it's not unique so yeah anyway. um more on the question of skill development and a person's value i think that's a good way to look at this too so i think maybe it might surprise well one question is if i'm a really if i'm really successful in architecture school does that mean I'm going to be really successful as an architecture employee? Not, not I'm not going to talk about being an employer and having your own office. That's a right, completely right. different league. But am I going to be successful as an architectural designer in an office? You know, and finding a job, doing well there. Uh, however, you define success, um, and that's a really interesting question because the answer is no. Um, if you're successful in school. There's a better chance you will be successful in practice because you have the skill sets that are embedded within you. You have the tools, but no, that doesn't guarantee anything. Um, first issue that comes to mind is the teamwork one that you described. In school, you don't have to be a good team player to be successful in school because it's about your individual work most of the time. In practice, you got to be a good team team player. You've got to know how to work in groups. And that, that doesn't just mean being nice to other people. You know, it means knowing how to um give up some things and compromise but also yeah. the opposite push push other people and that's tricky compromising is difficult because you're probably used to doing your own thing you don't want to compromise on the other hand it's tricky to be actively uh be engaged and active and open and to help that team move forward and not just shut down and just be the one who compromises like if you're a team player you're you're not just sacrificing stuff on your own you're contributing to that team and you're pushing that whole team forward mm -hmm. that's not the same thing as as doing things well at your own at your desk you know at midnight um the other thing is the success in school is determined by your ability to do every aspect of the school project from getting the brief conceptualizing or thinking of a concept rather and developing the concept producing models and all the finishing finished deliverables which are just drawings and models and things like that and then giving a presentation that is the 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 project in, in success right in practice that's not the case um in, in fact your ability to like figure out how to make a weird cool model out of different materials and like this and that directly does not translate to practice a lot of times it's the ability to problem solve in new scenarios. Yeah, that's important. Like I said, that's the skill. That's the real skill. But the the, the translation of, of one's ability to be successful in school does not go directly to practice. What that and also in school, you kind of define your own process. When you work for someone else, they might have a process you will have to adopt. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, you know, like. Yeah, what does that mean? I don't know, like they might require you to do certain types of research or sketches or, you know, they might even ask for specific design options to be looked at where mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have the freedom to come up with it. Or, you know, maybe there is an order, like you do a sketch by hand and you put in 3D and then you do some renderings. Well, maybe if it was up to you, you know, you do something completely differently or you would like you, you would define what's your starting point and how you want to go about it when offices sometimes are have expected deliverables and they have an expected process or you know things that they like to do yeah. a certain way so that's a big one you know you kind of yeah. have to like that, that's a that's an odd yourself to yeah. make it work <laughs> that's a really odd sensation because now you're, you're doing something that you're supposedly passionate about but you're having to do it in a way that you don't know how to do it in that way yeah. so and it's not just about not knowing how you might not want to do it that way and you know like as stupid as it sounds like even the own um the office environment itself, like the I, the office environment itself, like I remember, like a, a few offices I worked at. at the beginning, I had a very hard time having, you know, um, focus. 
any design ideas coming up because mm. I didn't feel like the environment was, I was feeling comfortable in it to um, design, yeah. you know, like spatially and the layout and people around and yeah. the noise and, you know, like th there was actually a lot more maybe smaller constraint and things you might not be aware of that impact how your ability of doing a task or another. Um, no, that's a really, really good point, and I think I, I, you know, I remember I was like, I yeah. can't, I can't draw, like I can't, uh -huh. and 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 everybody's looking at me like I'm supposed to come up with this thing, and I'm like, that's not how I, how I used to work in school. I was just me in my studio apartment doing all kinds of weird shit, and you know, like eventually after four hours of like you know torture, I would come up with something, yeah, you know. But when also time is a constraint within the design process and the creative process, it's very. And there and there is expectations, you know. There's pressure. There's all kinds of things that just start mm -hmm. to pile up, and mm -hmm. it could be overwhelming. Yeah, because in school you have the time and space to. You're wasting a lot of time and resources. What you're you doing? You are. Yeah. Because you don't know what you're doing. Yes, but also because sometimes the creative process requires that. Like, oh, maybe I should make a model. Maybe I should get some crayons. Maybe I should go dance. Maybe I need to walk around. Maybe I need to get a coffee. Maybe I need to talk to peers. There's so many. You could do whatever you want to come up with an yeah. idea. Right, because you have that studio space, which is so sacred. In an office, though, you know, stu studios in school are, are like they're really crazy places. They're messy a lot of times. There's people are building stuff. There's like little forts and uh, you know, there's beer bottle. It's like it's a mess, right? And there's something about that that helps you feel like you can do whatever you want to get to the point you need to. When you're in an office, and let's say that office on the extreme end is more corporate, and you have a desk that's you know manufactured by like Knoll. <laughs> Or Herman Miller, one of these office desk, you know, places, and you have like a little pinup board that's like super generic, and you have your monitor that's the same height and, and size you have as everyone else. Someone sitting across from you or desk, you. <laughs> and you have the same chairs as everyone else, and you have like carpet, and then you have clients walking through, and partners, everyone, people wearing suits and things. He's like, oh, am I am I allowed to sketch anything right now? I, you know, like, I, I remember at the beginning, I was very, I was very um, aware, you know, like on my bosses, my superior, like. You know, watching me. If I'm not working, drawing anything, they're gonna think I'm not doing anything. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, now yeah, I don't yeah. care, right? But there's so much. You it's just care. I don't know. I keep an eye over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, or like they ask you to use that software and yeah. you've never used it, so you're like clunky on yeah. it, and you can't get the ideas, you know, drawn or expressed the way you're thinking about them. And you have a presentation in two hours, and you know, and 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 you're in charge of it, and you know, you want to have time to eat lunch because you get this thing to do. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a very it's, it's kind of a different. It's like you're you're. You're tr you're trying to walk again, you know, like you're you're relearning how to walk. Like you were running before, and now you're kind of like limping around, and like, yeah. you know. You know, I, I bet that's why a lot of people they they will graduate, work in office for like maybe a couple of years, and they leave, um, yeah. because they realize there's just there's, there's too much constraints and and conformity is a word, right? Like a big part of of working, it, it feels like is that you're having to conform to the to the way the office runs. And there's sometimes good reasons for that. An office has a philosophy and they, they found success with it. And maybe they are right. And you are, I wouldn't say right or wrong, but maybe they do have a, a better way of doing things that you need to learn. And a lot of times, though, it's not the case. You know, it's just, it's, it's you know, like things did, like, how do I describe? Like in a design studio in school, the atmosphere of the studio, the, the students, how people work and don't work develops organically. It's a very grassroots thing because this teacher's not there all the time. So whatever you 12 people decide to do in that space, that's what you do. And it's like, it's amazing that way. In an office, that's not really the case, especially if it's a bigger office. There's a force that's coming down on top to make everything feel a certain level of quality and consistent so they can, so when clients come, it doesn't look like a mess, for example. Or it's not just about the office space either. It's about the whole mentality, right? The, 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 you know, it's about the office culture. It's about yeah. the hierarchy, the politics. There's like many, many layers overlapping and intertwined, and it's complicated. And the weird thing is that that space, both physical and conceptual, is much more authored by the person at the top. At the same time, there are a lot of things that are there that are a result of things just kind of happening over time out of necessity. Like the office grows from 15 to 30 people. And now there's certain ways of working, certain politics, certain shortcuts and whatever paths that exist within that office that no one actually sat down and thought about 
if it makes sense, if this is the best way to to design the office. Again, I mean that physically and conceptually, right, and socially. It's just there,、mm -hmm. right? And that's the problem with most places, most offices. In school, you have freedom in the studio, but again, there is there is structure to that studio, and that has been designed by a person who has dedicated their life and the people they work with, the other teachers and the deans and whoever else. They dedicate their lives to thinking about structuring this.、Um, so yeah, I think. But you're right. Conforming, you show up, and it's like. You don't know how to print stuff. You want to print, but like, can I print? What's the code? And it's so, very. Yeah, and I think it's the the stress. I mean, uh, you yeah, you know,、um, it, it it's something that in school maybe you deal with just like a, f a few hours, a few days before a final review. So it's only happening, like, you know, a couple of times. You know,、mm -hmm. in offices it could be every week. Every week you have stress. Every day you could have stress, and、yeah. so it's I don't know. It's a lot of different things to be aware of, and and learning how to manage. Yeah. And、um, in terms of the value one brings, you know, I was saying like in school, it's your ability to kind of do everything on your own. In an office, that's not really going to be the case because in an office they have a system in place. They have a way that you print, a, a certain colors you use for the floor plans, like all of that's in place. So, so the the learning curve you're talking about is more about learning those things and then being able to think cre creatively in that setting, which is not always easy to get over that. You know.、Um, But it's also recognizing, like your value to the office might not always be your ability to think conceptually or creatively. Creatively, yeah. Sometimes it is, depending on the office and all the circumstances. But a lot of times, it's more like, can you execute this for me? The how, right? Do you know this program? Do you know Revit? Blah. Do you know AutoCAD? Blah. You know, can you produce it in this time frame? You're much more of a Sounds depressing. You're much more of a cog in a machine, right? And do you fit? Are you the right size cog? Can you do this? Can you last? Can you be productive and efficient? At least when you start, I mean, it gets eventually better at some point. But yeah. Yeah, and I'm not saying that's all offices, right?、Like、good office will prioritize things slightly differently. But that is one of the the tough things you to to deal with in transition. And I think that people should know about it. And I think that people should also be. Again, when you graduate, you have to have that bigger picture. Understand that you're in an ocean. Understand that your ability to manage and create your path and what you do to have success is going to happen at a much, much, much bigger scale. So, perseverance and patience become really important in a certain way, I think. And、um, not losing sight of the thing that you want to be doing—that's difficult to do in practice. It's really difficult to do because of all the Um, inherent challenges with doing a building, and also with the structure of offices. That's a beautiful way to conclude this conversation, David. Okay. <laughs> do you they, think? Do they?、Uh, it's, it's, it's up to you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this、uh, fellow designer episode. It was good to be back talking to our fellows. Hope you're all doing well.、Yeah. Uh, well, what else? What's up? We have a hotline. You can react to this episode. Send us some questions, some stories, or suggestions. The number is two one two. Nope. No two one three two 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 six nine five zero. Yep. <sighs> I got a blank right there. <laughs> <laughs>、uh, you can also shoot us an email、uh, at hello at secondstudiopod dot com. We're also on most of the social media:、uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find those. Episodes, those podcast episodes, on our website secondstudiopod dot com, and on Apple Podcast and Spotify and YouTube. We're everywhere. My goodness.、Yeah. Also, reminder to our、uh, book giveaway winner of the a hundred contemporary houses book. The winner is T P O H one two three eight semicolon nine on Apple Podcasts. If if it's you, if you're the one who le who left that review. Please send us an email with the screenshot of the review before it was submitted and your mailing address, so we can ship that little book to you. Awesome! Thanks again to everybody for listening and leaving reviews and watching and reliking, reliking,、uh, reposting and liking and all that stuff. It, it does help us. It means a lot to us, and、um, we're going to keep going. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.